I'm just wondering if we could, if I could play my phrase and then you could play it and we could see how, sure. how they relate back and forth. Yeah. Sounds okay, good. so I'll play it first and then, and then you play it. I did not really like this concerto very much as a teenager. I found it very heavy. But then uh, when I was in my, I guess my 30s, I decided to learn it. It became something very different when I got to know the music myself. Um, and I've performed it a lot since then. <laughs> Playing Bach on the piano is something that is um, still a lively debate. Uh, some people feel that people shouldn't play Bach on the piano. Um, other people pl think that playing Bach on the piano should be as closely an imitation to playing on a harpsichord or a clavichord as you can make it. Um, some people play with absolutely total abandon, enjoying the instrument with no thought of any kind of historical performance practice. Uh, so there's a very wide range of attitudes towards playing Bach on the piano. Uh, my feeling is the piano is the most glorious instrument and I want to enjoy the instrument and use all of the capabilities of the instrument to illuminate Bach's music. I think Bach would have loved this modern day instrument. Uh, he was a man who was really interested in many different kinds of instruments and was constantly uh, transcribing his own music for different instruments. So I embrace playing Bach on the piano. I do use the pedal um, and I try to think about every kind of sonority and texture and articulation that can be afforded by using this instrument. So you have to decipher what is it that is to be transmitted to the listener and what is it that is to be understood by you that goes beyond the knowledge of the listener. Sometimes I hear people playing box music and every single detail is shown and it's almost overwhelming it's too much it's like you know somebody who who has a tremendous amount of knowledge talking to you when you're when you're just a layman and I think that it's important to think about the hierarchy of what is important to show and what's important to conceal <laughs> one thing right. so um, in these sections like uh, starting at measure 46 it's the, the violins are starting to have this dialogue um, can, can you just play that for the two of you sure just so I'll just start the pickup to 46 <laughs> I think yeah. that what's really lovely is to hear the second violin, which you're doing, but we, if we're all aware of the second violin more than the first violin, I think it's interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. We don't expect that. Yeah, it's, it's a great moment <laughs> because we're, we're sort of, you know, the, you know, from the beginning yeah. and suddenly we have this, but it's like, <laughs> it just has more presence. Right. Yeah. So can, can we try that together? Mm -hmm. So yeah. just right I'll, on that pickup to 46. <laughs> 
It's okay, it's all right, it's all right. I'm just kind of nervous. When the viola solo starts, what's very interesting is that you have this melody that's happening, right? And then at measure 83, it changes into single notes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the piano has a pattern which is going against your melody with alternate notes, like each hand has an alternate note, 16th notes. And then in measure 82, the piano melody, the piano pattern changes, and a new pattern starts. And what's really beautiful is that your change doesn't happen with my change, and and that's something that's really interesting that Bach tends to do. That that many times we don't all change at the same time. The voices don't all change at the same time. They kind of stagger, and so um, I'm going from something that's quite sort of in a way kind of motoric to something that's more, more, more lyrical, but you haven't gotten there yet to this <laughs> next part. So I don't know if we can try to show that more, um, but let, maybe we just try it and be aware of it. So let's do from 76. So okay. um, I'll just do. So this first beginning, the, when, the, when we all played together in the very, very opening, I said that that was one of the hardest parts of the whole piece. It's so hard because the articulation is very, very hard. So the main question that I have is how to do... Because string players can play that in many different ways, and this is something that I want to discuss with them. They could play, uh, they could do, they can, so, they could do. One thing that they really can't do is that they cannot play this kind of articulation. So I like this kind of articulation in Bach, which is not staccato and it's not legato. It's kind of sort of in between. It's not, but it's, and it's not. It's almost connecting, but not quite. that 
that that articulation speaks and there's a whole range of how long you can make that note. You could make you could change when you lift and by just a little little bit and it completely changes the feeling of, of the piece. But that kind of articulation is really, really hard to do with string players. They they just it's unnatural. It doesn't sound natural to them. I they generally speaking, it's it's either connected on the bow or they're using different bows. But to do this kind of almost porta portato is is odd. And this this kind of articulation has a slightly slightly percussive sound in the best sense of the word. I percuss, percussion gets a bad rap. I mean, I have to say that some of the most interesting musicians I've ever met are percussionists because they're thinking about timbre and articulation in the most expressive way. Um, but how you can make this sound... It has a little bit of, of an impact when you're playing it, which is really, really nice and clear. And uh, so something to think about when you're playing. Um, and this will be a question that we'll have. The other thing is that these uh, syncopated ties, so you have, you first you have, that's tied. They're always tied over the strong beats. Oh. So what I've found when I play with string players is they tend to do, They let go, they do. They start the sound loud and then they and then it disappears. And I feel like the sound should keep on continuing. I want to hear it grow. And this is something as a pianist which is so frustrating, is that you know, once you play a once you play something, obviously you can't control the sound anymore. It's 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 done. But there's a way of playing an imagining sound that can make you feel and it makes it sound like the sound is evolving after you've struck the key. So I like it to feel that after I strike that key, it's continuing to the next note and then it continues to the next note. So let's see if I can do that. So I'll do from the measure before, for measure two. So I want it to feel like these notes are keeping on going. So this is something that I have to talk about with the string players and see how, how can they achieve that with me. So I was talking earlier about this first phrase of the first movement and how complicated it is to yeah. figure out the um, articulation and the phrasing. And um, I was talking about how on the piano, you can get this kind of slightly right. detached thing, but it sounds a little odd on string players when, when you do it. So I'm just wondering if we could, if I could play my phrase and then you could play it and we could see how, sure. how they relate back and forth. Yeah. Sounds okay, good. so I'll play it first and then, and then you play it. Noticing is that this second measure that you talked about, which is that you know I'm attempting to yeah. elongate it yes. more than I might. I might, you know, if I if I were just playing it by myself. Can you play that again? Time. How you would the, play? It? Um, 
I think the thing that's different than how I hear it is that you connect. You mm. connect those notes. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? And part of that has to do with just the, um, the way that we use the bow. I you see. Know, the the I back see. and forth with the, you know, the sort of the assumption is when you have a down bow or you have something at the frog, that there's just, there's weight. Do you want to show what the frog is? Just yeah, so, so this is, yeah, the, <laughs> the frog <laughs> looks exactly like a frog um, of the bow and then the tip. And so, um, you know, the bow really, the modern bow is sort of a, a more elongated and sort of flattened out, straightened out version of, of what it used to be in um, earlier times where it was much more of like a, an actual bow, so that uh -huh. when you're when you're putting it down on the string, the way it sort of holds, it would it would be a lot easier to get weight at the frog, and it still is that way. But the modern bow makes it easier for us to, you know, sustain right. all the way through. But we always have to work a little harder at the up bow because that's the weak end. I see. That's where our our arm is the weakest, but also the um, the stick, yeah, is sort of the weakest, and although weak is not a great a great word, but it just it has a different feeling. So if something starts on an up bow, has a different quality than right. You know, there's a there's a sort of weight, a sort of knees bent, sort of built into that, and so yeah. that that affects this phrase. The So they're, is there any way, equal. is there any, I'm just curious, uh, yeah. is there any way that that each first eighth note could be a down bow, or is that not possible? Yeah, I mean, it would, it would require either, I'm doing that on the third one of these right. statements, so I'm going, the bowing that I'm doing is, We can go I see. I see. Uh -huh. For that sort of reaching quality, because right. again, sort of chose an up bow so that it can uh, move up and kind of flow into a lot louder sound going towards the frog. But um, we could try. I mean, there are a lot of different possibilities. What, what, what did you or, just do? I like that, what you just which did. Which was doing that where I sort of retake. Retake, yeah. Retake the down bow. So down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. Because that's so. kind of what I'm doing. I'm doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't, or it could be even longer. Is definitely a Boeing that I wouldn't you wouldn't do do mm -hmm. but I mean sometimes you could see if it had a different a different sort of light feel what what, what, what did you do so there? that was down up up down up up down so that, that's sort of like the idea of the waltz right yeah. so yeah yeah so can, right. can you play that in tempo? Um, the down, up, up? Down, up, up. Which has, again, a totally different kind of sound than yeah. we're looking for. Because this, to me, with the D minor, you know, there's so many pieces in D minor that have this incredible weight and kind of, I don't know, presence. It feels very um, stone-like. Yeah. You know, that I'm not sure that that's the sound that yeah, we're that's necessarily not the sound. going for. I think the thing that I don't want is for it to be... Right, so, um, the second, the second mm -hmm. eighth, the, the A, mm -hmm. can that be longer? Well, see, the thing is also with the bowing, um, if I do it as it comes, yeah. I remember speaking to a wind player who said, I have no idea what bowings are, but all I keep hearing is retake as it comes, and start at the frog. Okay. <laughs> you know? and so as it comes would be just doing the bows back and forth down and up. On each so, note. So that's what I've been doing, which is. I see. So 
you're, so getting, you're getting, that, getting an uppo. That different sort of yeah. sound on that second one, which is very perceptive of you. <laughs> to be like, can't you have them all in a down bow? Um, but that's sort of the string player's work to try to get that to sound similar. So. It, it's harder to make yeah. that. Yes, I, mean, I that's think that's the down, down, up, down, down, up. Mm -hmm. That's down, down, mm -hmm. up. There's really not a right way or a wrong way to play this music. Of course, I would argue that that's the case for any piece of music, even if there are loads of markings. There's not one way to play it. Um, but I think a lot of students often think that there is a right way to play it and that there are rules. And uh, I say, I don't think there are any rules. I mean, you can choose your rules if you want to. You can choose to try to think about something from a historical perspective, or you can choose to think that um, you come from a certain tradition of teachers who thought that uh, a staccato meant a certain thing. Um, but basically, in my opinion, there are no rules, and um, I'm constantly changing how I feel about a piece of music and and that's part of for me that's part of the most exciting aspect of being a musician is that um, there's never going to be an answer and so I like the search and I like the fact that every time I play this piece it's going to be different and sometimes I'm going to play it with people that have a wildly different approach than I do and that'll be interesting or it might be frustrating or I might learn something or I might know that I never again want to play it like that. But um, it's always a process and it's always evolving. And that's why you hear people record the same piece multiple times and, and that's why they're, you know, we're endlessly fascinated to hear lots of different people play the same piece of music because um, there's just an endless number of ways that you can do it. Also, you're making it, you're giving it a kind of lilt with mm -hmm. the, the 16th notes are moving faster than the 8th notes. Mm. Yeah. And I'm, I think I think of it more... It's more. Yeah. yeah. It's actually pretty stable mm -hmm. rhythmically. Yeah. Should um, we try it together? Let's, let's try it together. Yeah. Yeah. How did that yeah. feel to you? It was it was interesting. I did the down, down, up, down, down, yeah. up. I'm not sure if you'd yes. want to get an entire orchestra doing that. I think that that's another that's another consideration is that yeah. it's one thing for us to do it right. singly, but when you right. have a group of violinists it might not be it, it might not because the thing is you might you would have so much variation in the amount of retake yeah. I mean, you, you just you know practicing it's would, hard. would make it yeah. better it's not an easy bowing um, as a string quartet player I sort of lived for <laughs> wacky bowings that you yeah. know, get exactly what you want but then again um, it's not impossible at all well I think I'd like something that might be slightly safer um, you know it has to do with also exactly where in the bow you want to play it. Uh -huh. So playing it out here might minimize some of that difference in the bow because you're, you're playing you're in, in, a sort in the of a top part area. of the bow. Yeah, okay. so yeah. it equalizes the sound a little bit more uh -huh. so that Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I think that that's great. Um, now, the, when you get to the next measure, mm -hmm. Dum, da -da -dum, dum, da -da -dum, dum. I love the up bow, but yeah. it, the sound seems to die. Mm. Instead of dum, da -da -dum, dum, da -da -dum, dum, is it possible to? Which is, yeah, which is the whole point of doing the up bow. So why don't we should try it again? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start from the beginning? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
much that was much more yeah so that's the nice again and as i was saying that's the benefit of doing the as opposed to which yes. still can happen and actually that sort of prioritizes the those specific tops of the moments that sort of diminished moment from the b flat to the c sharp to the to the um, e makes it more of like an arrival right as opposed to as something that's growing so I, that this bowing um, is going to be fine in an, in a larger setting okay yeah okay that's good to know yeah <laughs>